Hi, welcome back to a new video. Today we will look at something that could almost be called a hardware legend. It's the Cooler Master V10, a so-called hybrid air cooler that was introduced to the market in 2009, so 14 years ago. Today we want to find out how this cooler can keep up with a recent air cooler. Even for today's standards, the Cooler Master V10 is one big air cooling unit. And I decided to compare it to the Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 5, which is a very recent air cooler. And the reason why I bought it is because it is listed at 100 euro, which is exactly the price this cooler was introduced for back in 2009. Obviously, if you take inflation and everything into account, this would have been a bit more expensive than this one, but both are kind of similar when it comes to price and also for the TDP they are rated for. So this one says it's rated for 270 watt TDP and this one was rated for 200 plus watt TDP. So yeah, that's why I want to find out how they compare to each other. And first of all, we will mount this on a 14900K because what would be better to check out how much heat you can dissipate because the 14900K doesn't even know where to go with all that heat. So yeah, 4900K, we will mount this on and see what kind of yeah heat we can dissipate and what kind of temperatures we can see. It's my first time using this cooler and the quality, like the build quality of this cooler looks very good overall. Like the paint, finish of the base, and also the way you mount it, like just put the back plate behind the board, then you add those two bars and then put the cooler on with the thing in the center, yeah. Not bad. This is kind of like a proprietary fan. It's like custom made. You can see it has special cutouts on the bottom to fit on top of the screws down there. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. If you look at this cooler from this angle, it looks kind of weird. It looks like somebody made the entire heatsink and like the fan in the center and then decided so A, Let's just bolt on this additional fan on the right for a little bit of extra performance. It just looks like it doesn't belong there, a little bit. I think the Dark Rock Elite makes it a little bit better because the shroud kind of emerges into like the cooler itself. So yeah, not sure. I mean, you all know it from the 14900K and like Cinebench, so we just run it. I also want to highlight I'm running unlocked power limits, so PL1, PL2 unlocked to 4095. You can see straight 100 degrees Celsius, which is expected with the unlocked power limit. You can see the CPU shoots directly to like 310 watt and then lowers itself to maintain yeah, the thermal limit of 100 degrees Celsius. And we can see that it continuously lowers the power draw. What I want to find out now is how much power can the cooler continuously dissipate. So I will just run the 30 minutes test of R23 loop and then we will check after like 15 or 20 minutes what kind of package power draw we can continuously pull with this Dark Rock Pro 5. After almost 20 minutes in Cinebench R23 we have an average of 272 watt that the cooler can continuously dissipate. I have to admit, I'm impressed how spot on the marketing of Be Quiet is with 270 watt TDP. And you also have to keep in mind that this is probably the rating for a 270 watt TDP CPU. Now keep in mind the 4900K is rated at a TDP of 125 watt, but you can see it consumes typically if you run it full load like twice as much and the cooler can still handle that. That was definitely a positive surprise. Also, I have about 25 degrees Celsius room temperature right now, and probably if I would go down to like 20 degrees Celsius, maybe even 280, 290 watt. So good baseline we have from a recent air cooler, and now we will switch to the V10 and see how this can keep up. So here we have the Cooler Master V10, which is surprisingly kind of similar to the Be Quiet cooler. So in the center, you have something that looks like an ordinary air cooler. And then on the right, you have like an additional air cooler bolted to it. And the main reason why it looks so odd is the tech that is on the bottom right of this cooler. I will try to get you an overview of the cooler first. I had to also adapt the mounting because I think original was like 775 or 1366, but I had to adapt it to 1700. So I milled some extra mounting yeah, pieces so I, we can mount it on a recent motherboard. So we have a huge amount of heat pipes that exit the cold plate and go to this piece right here where we have a good amount of surface area to dissipate heat and we have a fan that's blowing down air from the top. The same amount of heat pipes, well the same heat pipes in general, they exit 
also on the other side to the tag. The tag is powered by a 4-pin Molex and, a, and at least according to spec it should be a 70 watt tag. Now the thing is with tag, if you're not familiar with it, it's like a small piece of ceramic basically and so if you apply a voltage to it, one side becomes hot and one cold. And the colder you keep the hot side, the colder the cold side will be. That's basically the idea of the tag. And what they did is they have this tag right here and try to dissipate heat through it. And the entire block of like fins, the entire heatsink right here, is connected to the hot part of the tag. So if we apply 12 volt from the PSU to this, then it will always mean that like constantly 70 watt have to be dissipated through this heatsink on the side. It also means that best case we can usually dissipate about 35 watt of heat. That's like the rule of thumb with tags. Usually only like 50% of the heat of the tag is what you can effectively dissipate, which is not a lot for especially recent CPUs. And then also there's this thing, so now imagine the cold side, maybe like zero degrees Celsius. Then, I mean, you have all the heat pipes connected also through here. So if this is like very cold, you're effectively heating with this side. Yeah, not quite sure the concept probably didn't make a lot of sense. Like hybrid tech, at least from what I know, never really made a lot of sense. And I think the only way to see what it can do is just power it on and see how much heat we can dissipate. But most of the heat will be dissipated through this side and through the side on the bottom right here. There's another yeah, stack of basically uh, fins, the same like what you have on the right we have here. And that's connected, as you can see, with heat pipes also to the cold plate. This box on the bottom, by the way, is the controller of the tech. And as far as I remember, it was also supposed to disable the tech whenever it's like going lower than room temperature to prevent any kind of condensation. But I'm not even sure if it would be able to reach that kind of low temperature. Well, especially now that it's mounted, you can see how massive this air cooler is. It's insane. Look at the size. It extends by probably like five centimeters to the right over the main board. It's also covering the entire memory slot area. So we have this fan on top. That's not even too bad. It provides additional cooling to the memory sticks. In theory, also maybe a little bit to some VRM parts of the main board. That's really not too bad. But you can also see I was only able to run smaller memory sticks. For example, Dominator Platinum or something like this would not fit underneath. At least in BIOS, the temperature is far from being impressive. I also made sure that the contact is really good between the cooler and the CPU. I double checked everything. Yeah, let's check in Windows. At least in Windows Idle, the temperature is kind of similar to the Be Quiet cooler. But now I want to compare the clock during load of Cinebench R23. We were seeing about 5.4 to 5.6 gigahertz with the Be Quiet air cooler. Well, the CPU package power looks kind of similar. We just start above 300 watt and now it's a little bit lower. But I would say overall the package power draw is kind of similar. Also, as a reminder, we saw about 39,000 points with the Be Quiet cooler. And now it's almost the same, I would say. It's maybe like measurement tolerance, but it's also like 39K. That's not even too bad. So after roughly the same time frame, we can find that the cooler is at a rate of 220 watt that it can constantly dissipate which is about 50 watt less than the Be Quiet cooler. And at the same time, it feels like it's three times as loud. Now the question that remains for me is if the tech even helps anything. Because if I just touch it, it just feels warm. Like both sides just feel warm and not quite sure about that. So I will just unplug it, repeat the test, and we will try to see if the amount of dissipated heat changes in any way. Pretty sure I don't have to test as long because already after 10 minutes I'm exactly at the same value again, 221 watt. That is quite strange. I'm not sure, I just want to double check some things. I'm going to attach my current clamp to 12 volt because pretty sure the tech is just going to run off that and not going to use the 5 volt. Nothing happens, that means there is zero current flowing across the 12 volt. Interesting development. 
and also explains why we saw exactly the same power draw in both scenarios. Also kind of cool to see how good it is to replicate the same scenarios. So just tried it twice and it was exactly the same power draw. So the testing methodology seems to be good. Now the question that remains is, is the controller damaged or the tech? Probably I have to take things apart and start some measurements. First thing to remove is probably the entire case body. I found some screws on top and also four here. I'm trying to get this off right now. Once the case and the fans are removed, there's not that much left. It's, yeah, not that special, I would say. It's like a double tower cooler with something weird hanging off the side. That's the controller. You can also spot a temperature sensor that makes contact with the cold plate directly. This way the controller can easily sense what kind of cold plate temperature we have. And the wire on the side goes to the tech. Not sure if you can see it, but like on top of the connector, there's something looked like it burned a little bit or some piece of solder that's left. Now that's interesting. Is this like the first version of NVIDIA's high power connector or what is this? Pretty sure this happened years before I tested this. Looks pretty like an old damage, but could be the same type of problem. Looks like the connector was not fully plugged and got damaged. Not sure if the PCB is damaged in any way or if it was just the connector not being fully plugged. In case the connector was not plugged, that could be an easy fix. Oof. Hmm. One thing is for sure, I'm not going to reuse that connector. Before I do anything else, I will just check if there is a short between those two and then I will maybe also attach it and see if there is any voltage being applied. So no short, nothing between the two. That looks already good. Just have to dissipate some heat of the CPU, attached it to 12 volt and now I'm going to check if there is any voltage being fed through the connector. Well, it's doing something. It's currently supplying seven volt. So at least not fully that. I soldered on the tech to the controller to make sure or kind of check if the connector was the problem or if there's some other issue. And then I will just hook it up to the Molex, see if we can detect the current or just also if this is getting like hot or cold. Mm -hmm. Well, at least we have some current. So right now we have this current clamp attached that's set to one millivolt per 10 milliamps. Basically means that if we read about 270, 280 millivolt. This translates to like 2.7, 2.8 amps that are flowing across this cable right now. I also checked the voltage, which is currently like six to seven volt. That means that like overall, the power of the tech right now is about 20 watt. That's, that's nothing. That's really not gonna help anything. Like seriously, with only 20 watt power, it's not going to change anything like worst case or best case probably is even going to make the results worse. As I said, I ordered some replacement tags. I will just swap the one in here. I'm not sure if this like aged to a certain degree, not quite sure. And I will just attach a normal Molex to the tag, which means that we will always have 12 volt and a max current applied to the tag, which should give us the best idea what's theoretically possible with this kind of design, with the hybrid design, and see if it's helping or not. Now that I removed the entire part that's responsible for cooling the tech, there's actually not that much heatsink left. Also explains probably why the Be Quiet should be able to dissipate more heat than this one. And this would be the heatsink that's just cooling the tech, as you can see, and also, especially on here, it didn't even make a good contact to that surface. You can see like 50% is not covered. So I will take this off, clean everything, apply a fresh amount of thermal paste and mount everything with the new tech. All right, new tech is already in place and now already mounted everything back together. Setup is up and running. As you can see, the tech is not connected yet. And those are the temperatures that we can currently see on a peak course, something between 29 to 36 degrees Celsius. And I will now plug in the tag and we will see what happens. Yeah, not sure. At least there is not a significant change. Maybe it's like one or two degrees Celsius at best, 
But apart from that, there's pretty much nothing else I can see. With the defective tech and controller, we were able to get like 38,800 to 39,000 points in R23. And now we want to repeat the same. First look, it looked a bit better. I think the CPU was able to maintain a higher clock speed at first, like 280, now 270 watts. That's how you can kind of fool yourself. It's the same score as before. So yeah, no change when it comes to that so far. Again, long-term testing with Cinebench R23 in the loop. As you can see, 227 watt, which is an increase of incredible 6 watt. Wow. You know, there is one thing that always blows my mind when we do reviews about products like this one, like rather special ones that even if you go back and check out reviews from back, back then, you can already straight see that they did not really deliver. Like Tech Power Up posted a review and basically said, it's no benefit over other high-end air cooling units. And then it kills me to think about that somebody must have been sitting at Cooler Master, for example, and tested and designed this thing and then plugged in the tech and then you're like, okay, so we have a controller that costs money, consumes power, and the tech cons consumes power especially, and it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't improve thermals, just consumes power. But let's still launch it anyway and make a mass product and sell it. That's the thing that kills me. Every single time we review products like this, special ones, and I can tell you that's not the last product with this style which we're going to review. I'm always wondering how did it even make it to the market? That's kind of mind-blowing. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time. Bye-bye.